Well, you know, most jobs do come from small businesses and not from large corporations. So small business is the backbone of America. And I think it, the, the climate has been a little bit challenging. I'm a small business person, too, and I've had to add on some paperwork and things like that in the last three or four years that didn't have before. So the amount of paperwork it takes to comply with federal regulations just continues to increase. In Washington, they seem to just enjoy putting more requirements on us for one reason or another, making it a little bit more difficult. Uh, some of my friends, we call it barbed wire, you know, you have to work through. We're talking with uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, uh, United States Air Force, retired. His book is called Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Like John McCain, who wrote your foreword, you guys turned lemons into lemonade. You know, I think so. Uh, we have been very, very successful. We had like 16 admirals and generals. We've had senators and congressmen, college presidents, corporate presidents, and just very teachers, very lawyers, doctors out of our group. We've just been very successful. I think we are a pretty uh, ambitious group for the most part. We're mostly air crew members that were POWs in the Hanover Hilton. And we came home ready to light the burners and go fly fast in, in our careers and catch up. And we just uh, had a lot of energy. And we've had a pretty good lifespan. You know, uh, Admiral Stocktail lived to be in his early, early 80s. Uh, Senator Denton was 89 when he died. Just lost him recently. That's right. And uh, General Reisner, Colonel Reisner, and later General Reisner, he lived to be almost 89. And Colonel Bud Day, Medal of Honor winner, was five and a half years there. Uh, he was 88. So we've had good good long-standing lives and very productive lives and i think we just uh, we enjoy life to the fullest but we want to stay busy and be contributing what did change you how would how why are you different today because of that yeah. that horrendous experience and by the way how long were you there i was there five and a half years 1955 days but who's counting? <laughs> yeah well we kept up somehow yeah. uh we mind has its own calendar mm -hmm. especially when there's not much else going on but I think for me, I did change a lot from that experience. I matured quite a lot, became more serious, more focused. Um, just, I think that's the main thing, more serious, more focused, and committed to do the hard work that it takes to be successful. Where I was more of a playboy. And not a playboy in that I didn't have a lot of money and all that sort of stuff, but a happy-go-lucky person, a little bit on the happy-go-lucky side. You know, I like I didn't worry about tomorrow, and I don't worry about tomorrow today, but I try to plan for it. Kind of a hotshot jet jockey type, type guy. Yeah, I yeah. guess so, and, and, and a little bit extreme in some of that, you know, mm -hmm. as far as being uh, carefree. Mm -hmm. Talking with uh, retired Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis, and uh, Colonel, I was always so personally embarrassed by our news media, and, and still am embarrassed by a lot of things that they do, but how they besmirched our military and how shabbily you guys were treated when you came up. We're, we're beginning, we recovered our fumble mm -hmm. uh, a couple of decades ago, but still the, the horrendous way you were treated when you got home, was, was dis, I thought was disgraceful and frank, frankly unpatriotic. Well, that's very true. Most all Vietnam veterans did not get a welcome home. They got spit on or uh, besmirched, as you said, and treated shabbily. The POWs were different in that the war was over, mm -hmm. the agreement had been signed, and so we were treated differently. We were treated uh, overall very well when we came home. Of course, we came home to families and neighborhoods and communities that had been praying for us and thinking about us every day. Mm -hmm. So that made a lot of difference. Uh, it was kind of a unique situation with us. So we got good treatment, but 99.9% .9 of Vietnam veterans, when they came home, certainly did not. When you got back, when did you decide to go into public speaking? When did you think, I have something to contribute and I can, I can show people a, a better way or give them an inspiration? Well, certainly not when I first came home. Uh, I had to go to work. You know, <laughs> yeah. I was six years behind my, my peers when I came home in operational experience. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Yeah. You know, I was just a young, young pilot when I got captured. I'd only been in the service a little over two years. And so I came home, and I was uh, now eight years in service. And then I got promoted two years early to major, so now I'm eight years behind my peers. <laughs> so I had to work hard for many, many years. So I just wanted to do my job and do a good job. I had a good career. It all worked out. I think I learned so much about leadership during my POW experience from the great leaders we had there. Uh, I was a junior-ranking guy, so I had some great leaders to learn from. And that stood me in good stead. It wasn't really until um, I wrote this book. I've written other books, but this one 
actually is about my POW experience, and it focuses toward leadership. But it's the story of the great leaders we had there and what our life was like and uh, how we got through that day to day. And there's 14 lessons in this book about uh, leading with honor, leadership lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. But only then did I start speaking uh, as a more of a profession and I, regularly. And so I travel and speak all over the world now. Did you find that it was therapeutic? A lot of the World War II guys that we talked to said that they couldn't talk about their experiences for a long time. Somebody finally encouraged them because said, you know, you're not going to be here much longer. You need to get these stories out. And they said once they started talking about it, that was the therapy that they needed. Yeah, I think it was for me, especially writing the book, because I had to research uh, every story to make sure it was accurate. I remembered the story, but I want to make sure I remembered it accurately because it had been, you know, mm-hmm. 38 years yeah. uh, since we'd come home. So I did research it. I contacted some of my friends. I went back into some of their books and read. So I, I went back through that experience in quite a bit of detail to write this book. And so that was pretty emotional. And that's why it took me three times as long to write this book as it did my other books. It was more complex in, in terms of the book, but also much more emotional. Right. Talking with uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, retired Air Force colonel. What, uh, tell me how what happened that day that you were, I guess you were shot down uh, and and you were captured. When when did it re- when, when did the reality hit you that I'm going to be here a while? Well, my airplane kind of blew up under me. Unfortunately, the cockpit part stayed intact, and it was tumbling and ejected. Got a good parachute, parachuted right into the gunners over over North Vietnam. I mean, they were shooting up at our wingman and maybe at me. Was captured within two minutes. I was really calm and cool. My training was fabulous and really executed that, and I was doing everything I could to evade capture. But then when I was captured and stripped down to my underwear, uh, that's when the shock hit. Uh, and I kind of had a little bit of time before I saw an English speaker to kind of gather my wits about me and realize that, you know, now I'm in for a different kind of battle. And then it was just day to day. Every day was a battle and a skirmish that I had to do my part to stay in the game and uh, hang on until the next day, until the next day, one day at a time. Mm-hmm. Did you ever at any point say, I'm, there had to become, at, at some point, every once in a while, there had to be like, I'm never getting out of here, or at least not alive anyway? No, I never thought that. I always believed that someday we'd go home. And, uh, you know, to me, believing the other was just not acceptable. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to believe that. And I knew that was there. They threatened us that if we didn't change our attitudes, that we might not go home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did have fear a few times that they might try to keep us, some of us there or all of us there for uh, after the war or whatever. But I also believed in our country, and that's why we we worked together as a team to make sure that that we were a team, and if one guy went home, we all went home. Mm-hmm. And this is, as the, as your your captors, what were they like? Uh, were you tortured, or were you, uh, I know you said you were threatened, yeah. but were you, uh, did you ever think that uh, may, tomorrow Lee may not be here? No, I think I always thought I'd be here. I just knew there was going to be some pain and suffering in between. Uh, I was tortured a couple of times, and some guys eight or ten times, and much more. Ninety-five percent of us were tortured at least once. So uh, that was part of the routine, especially in the first three years. They did stop the torture the last two years, thankful to thanks to the American people putting so much pressure on them about our treatment. They actually did change it when Ho Chi Minh died, and they stopped the torture for the most part. Mm-hmm. So that 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 helped, but. Uh, you know, I just I just had to get through today, and, and I saw that other people made it, and they made it through the day, and so I had to believe that I could make it through the day. And, you know, uh, I grew up in a strong Christian home and uh, had strong Christian faith, and when I, when I lived through that shoot-down and capture, and then the local populace tried to kill me, and uh, my captors actually, the soldiers, kept me alive and protected me and got me to Hanoi, and was bombed two or three times en route to Hanoi, and went through all of that and I said you know I think I'm supposed to live so now I got to do my part to live here God's got a plan I got to come out the other side of this thing and it'll be redeemed someday and it has talking with uh, Colonel Lee Ellis uh, retired Air Force Colonel talking about his Vietnam experiences uh, Colonel the it was it's been said that uh, Admiral Jerry Denton that we just lost recently who was here a couple of years ago for for a speech 
um, one of the things that uh, that really got the the ball rolling to get you guys out was when he went on television and blinked with his eyes yeah. in Morse code about yeah. torture, and that really that really got things uh, motivated to, to get you guys out. Well, it uh, was the first time that the U.S. government knew exactly what our treatment was. They knew there were torture going was torture going on, and you know, I talked about this morning in my presentation. I showed his picture and and the the T O R T U R E that he blinked in Morse code, and you know, you can type into your browser, type Denton blinks torture, and you can see that actual interview and see him blinking torture today. Amazing, the courage it took to do that. And I can't, I can't imagine the, the concentration that it had to take to, and the practice that he had to take, but, but you guys had nothing but time on your hands. Right. So what, what, would, what, what was a day like for you as far as I've heard guys saying they played a round of golf in their mind, they, they tapped out Morris Code to their, their buddies in another cell. Mm-hmm. How, did, uh, how did you cope with the, the day-to-day boredom? All of the above. Okay. Uh, it, it could be uh, a lot of times I stayed busy. We actually couldn't tap Morse code. We had another tap code, mm-hmm. uh, which you can read about there in the book. But we had all sorts of codes to communicate with. So a lot of time was communicating covertly because they wouldn't let you communicate over, openly. There was some time in prayer, time in reflection, remembering the good things I'd done, but some of the bad things I'd done that I wish I hadn't done. Uh, <laughs> One time I spent two days remembering everybody in my 8th grade science class and which seat they sat in just for something to do. Uh, One time I spent two months farming in my head. I started with 40 acres, and and I would work 12 hours a day on this farm in my head. And Sometimes I get a headache just thinking about figuring all the math out, Mm -hmm. you know, fencing in land and buying and selling and putting in crops and how much seed per acre and fertilizer per acre and figuring out the you know the math of it all as far as a business and at the end of two months i owned almost the whole county (laughs) i didn't have to pay any taxes and i could set my own prices i tried to be realistic on my prices but i kept reinvesting all the profits because it didn't cause anything to live (laughs) my food and shelter were provided for so but it, it passed the time and i learned a lot you know i used my math and i learned to do things in my head uh, there was a, and to plan things through and work things through in my head, which turned out to be a very good skill for life. What was your crop, by the way? All of them. Well, I had I had cattle and grass and corn and uh, no cotton. I grew up with cotton. I didn't want any cotton. So, yeah, wheat and oats and corn and that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Now, now that you're you're back, when did the motivational speaking part begin? And and what uh, and and obviously it's worked out well for you. Yeah, I had done a little bit of speaking over the years, uh, here and there, once or twice a year. But when the book, this last book came out uh, a little over two years ago, that's when I started speaking uh, quite a bit as a motivational speaker. So now I do probably my business, my consulting business uh, has dropped back to maybe 30, 40 percent of what I do. And 60 or 70 percent of it is motivational speaking. So I travel a good bit. I've been uh, been to Asia uh, been to Europe. I'm going back to Europe uh, in October this year, speaking for an international company. So it's a lot of fun. I can imagine. We're talking with Colonel Lee Ellis, uh, reti- United States Air Force, retired his Vietnam experiences. Colonel Ellis, what is the, the, the things like this always have a domino effect. They always have a rewarding thing of people sending you emails or coming up to you afterwards. And I was there, mm-hmm. and and I wasn't treated. I was treated shabbily when I got home or whatever. And what you said today meant meant the world to me. Or mm-hmm. you know, my kid. I wanted my kids to hear this. Whatever it is that you get uh, some sort of great feedback from this, or or that that oh, it I makes get, it so much. Oh, I get so much encouragement. I don't think anybody in the world gets as much encouragement as I do. It's amazing. <laughs> I am. I've been so blessed, and and that encouragement helps. Though it gives me the courage, encouragement, and uh, positive affirmation of what I'm doing and the message that I'm speaking. It's really about leading and living with honor, and it takes courage to do that. You can't live and lead with honor without courage. You'll, you know, your fears will take you out. We see that every day in leadership. So that's a message that I am trying to uh, to spread, and I invite my audiences to participate in that and to share that message with others i just i get but i get so much positive feedback that uh, i want to keep doing it. it energizes me it fortifies me against the negatives of the world and i just i can't tell you how blessed i feel 
to to be able to be a firm like that, but to be able to carry this message forward and to have the health and strength to do it. I'm 70 years old, wow. and I went for a nice uh, jog down the river this morning, and you know I do my no push-ups. And I still sure. play basketball with my grandchildren, and uh, you know I'm I'm having I'm having a fun. I'm really having a lot of. I love what I do. I love my consulting. I love my leadership co- coaching. I like writing. I just wrote a blog over the weekend. They'll be out next week about free the captives Mm -hmm. and how uh, we all need freedom from what's holding us back. Mindsets we have, behaviors, habits that we have, we need to get freedom from those to grow to the next level. Colonel, I hope you're being invited to to talk to high school kids. I hope you're invited to make college commencement addresses um, because we hear from so many politicians who want to make it political. And speaking of which, the illegal aliens that are pouring across here. People, once upon a time, they keep saying that we're a nation of immigrants. Well, those immigrants came here to be Americans. They didn't come here to, to suck off the, the public teat, as it were. Uh, they can, and So what do you see now with this administration that doesn't seem to be supportive of the military? Uh, doesn't, I mean, they're cutting way back. Uh, they're, you know, and these people are pouring across, these kids are pouring across the border, and they don't seem to be that concerned about it. Well, because of my role as a speaker, I try not to get into the politics too much. I try to talk about principles. I think the principle that we need to most in this country is uh, accountability and uh, obeying the law and telling the truth. And if we do those three things, and whatever political party somebody's in, if we can have accountability for telling the truth and obeying the law and professional ethics and morality that is commonly accepted, that we would all accept, I think we'll be strong as a country to the degree that we don't hold our leaders accountable and ourselves. We have to start with ourselves. And this is not easy, I'm telling you. It's one thing to talk it, but it's, it's, it's hard. It takes courage to walk that talk of leading and living with truth and uh, doing the right thing and accountability. It is not easy. It takes a lot of courage. And, you know, I like to uh, use a line, a quote from The Return of the Kings, which is part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm-hmm. It comes on the screen in that trailer. You can go online and see it. It says, there's no freedom without sacrifice. There's no victory without loss. And there's no glory without suffering. That's the reality of life. And I say, I want to add one more to that. There is no honor without courage. You cannot live and lead with honor without courage. I heard you talking today uh, as you were winding up talking about that, that there has to be a price to be paid for these things rather than people just coming along and saying, you know, you, you see so much of that attitude today of uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to it, all these right. entitlements that we're right. supposed to have. Well, what we're entitled to is the opportunity to uh, live in our country by our laws and compete and go out and make a living and do the things that uh, it takes to live. That's what we're entitled to, the opportunity, the opportunity to become an American, the opportunity to be successful. We're not in, and we're not entitled to be successful. God bless you. Appreciate it, sir, from an old Signal Corps captain. Thank Salute. You. Thank you for your service to our Thank country. You, right. Good being with you today. It's great to be in Savannah and see uh, these ships coming up the river. We have a wonderful port here, and I'm mm-hmm. so proud of it. I tell people everywhere I go about this port in Savannah and what a great place it is. And I'm so excited they're going to be ex- uh, expanding it some. Yeah. And you live in Georgia. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm a native Georgian. I live up uh, north of Atlanta in the suburbs.